I will make a start. I'll make a start. Well, um, we'll go through this and we'll see how we go. Please do stop me if it doesn't make sense. Because the fact is, you made the effort to come in. And I really want to make sure that I'm making some sense. Um, I can put this on your screens if it will help. Shall I do that now, or are you not bothered? Okay, well, if, if you want it, just let me know. Right, so what I've got is this document I've been emailing you out, uh, the template. And I've gone through uh, the analysis section, I went through that last week, but I've added a few bits in here. So I'm not really going to give you much new information on this, I just want to show you where they all are. So I'll zoom in a bit further so you can actually see it. But first thing to see is this is the contents page. And you see the contents page gets quite big quite quickly. So your finished contents page will probably be about three pages long. Um, it's, it's just because there are so many sections. So um, I won't go through all of this. Uh, what I've done, I've added a, a single um, page here, just the, as an introduction to the analysis section. You might want to do that. Um, you can add a brief overview of what the analysis section might contain and I've put a link in there so you can just click on it and go straight to the mark scheme. Um, or you can just write the word analysis and leave a blank page. Um, completely up to you how you do it. Um, I don't want to guide you too closely because then I'll get every single project in there will be the same. So we don't really want that. Um, this is all the same so there's nothing different in there, it just says about what font to use. And, um, uh, what font size to use, please don't submit anything in size 14 font, even on the drafts, because um, it's it's not a good thing to do, it looks unprofessional. And, uh, straight away your reader, not me, the, the examiner, will be put off by things like that. Um, again, I've mentioned this quite a long time ago, with your references, try and set that to Harvard, and if you're going to reference something on a regular basis, let's say there's a particular website that you like and you're using that a lot, maybe some sort of Unity help guide or maybe um, some sort of a shared dealing site, then make sure you put it into your citations, um, add a new source and you can choose book or you can choose journal or you can choose website. Journals look great but obviously at this level of your study you're unlikely to use them very often, um, but if you can get a journal in there, that's great. Um, but the, with a the website, it asks you for an author. Generally, there's an author name on every web page, so there's, there's some sort of name that you can use. If not, you can just tick corporate author and put the, the name of the company and take you down there. Name of the web page, the year um, the web page was created. Normally, that's on the site as well. Um, if you can't see it, unofficially take a best guess and then the year access, the month access, the day access, that's when you're actually looking at it. So that'd be today's day if it's the day you're looking at it. And then um, the URL, so where, where is this website? And that will then create um, a, a reference in your work that you can add as many times as you want. Um, so for example here, there's one there. Um, and you can put that wherever you like and I don't know where that popped out. Let's try that again. There we go. Um, and then you can also um, insert under references a. Uh, where is it? I've lost it now. There's a way to insert an entire bibliography. There we go. I'll stick this in. It won't look right because it should be right at the end of the document. But there you go. So you can see how that be listed. And if you've got sort of ten or more um, references, that looks really professional at the end. I will take that out though, because that's right in the middle of everything and I don't want that there. So anyway, that's, that's that. Um, I won't go through everything that's written in there because I'm hoping you've read it and, and are using it in some way. Um, but if you don't have any questions on this, tell me, tell me now or email it. Or, or just make sure that I know, because if I know you've got a question, I'll be able to answer it. Um, okay, so where are we? Where are we? Just trying not to scroll through too much. Um, 
The proposed solution, that's part of your analysis, um, is, is a, a high level overview of what your project will do. So, just that this is what I wanted to do. It's not an in depth thing, it's not looking at individual buttons or anything else, it's a high level overview of what it will do. And then that leads you on to the uh, design section where you can go, or you should go into some depth, and you should say, this is exactly how I'm going to do it. Now, I did go through this last week, so I'm not going to drone on and on and on. But um, again, what I've done here, I've added, this is all new. So from page 10 uh, onwards, um, you can discuss what's going to be in your design section, or you can just put the heading design and leave it blank. Um, completely up to you, whichever you think works best. And then I mentioned this last week, but I'm going to show you it in here. Um, breakdown of the problem systematically uh, into a series of smaller problems suitable for computational solutions explaining and justifying the project. So that's where you need to take that big problem, you need to break it down into smaller bite-sized chunks. Um, things that you can um, address. And I'll put an example of the first chunk. Well, the first chunk generally doesn't include much testing, it generally doesn't have much going on in it. The first chunk will generally be you learning about something in particular. So uh, we need a start and an end date. I'm just looking at the bullet points there. We need a start and an end date. And um, I need to know what you're intending to achieve. Um, and then we also need a formal test plan for each section. So you, you can get away with as few as four iterations. You don't have to have 50 iterations um, before you think, oh, this is going to be tons of work. You can get away with four if you can safely divide your project up into four chunks that you think you can manage. Now, don't worry if at this stage you, you don't know how to do it. So if one of the things in your project is uh, sounds very complicated and you're not sure how to do it, don't worry about that because we can learn that. Um, but do put it down. That's something that you want to achieve. It's... it's uh, you know, that's something you want to achieve. So what I've done, I've taken um, an example here of a uh, somebody who's designing a till system. And um, task one, build the forms. And you've got the 4th of June there to the 14th of June. So this person's going to give themselves 10 days to build the forms. And you know what forms are, you've dealt with them before. And if you feel confident, 10 days is probably enough. If you think 10 days is nowhere near enough, there's no pressure. You know, it's, you set the deadlines to suit. You have to ideally have everything finished by about um, Valentine's Day, February the 14th. So you can play around with your deadlines and you can make them uh, uh, suit. But remember you've got to type things up as well afterwards. So if your project is long and quite complicated, you might want to finish everything by January and give yourself a bit of contingency. But First thing this chap's going to do, uh, he's going to design his UI, he's going to design his, uh, his forms. Um, and he's written in here, or I've written, um, in this phase I will build three forms that I think uh, I will need to complete the project. Um, I will complete the till screen, management summary screen, and the stock level screen. And you'll notice there what I've done is I've made this section um, landscape rather than portrait. That's fine just because it fits in. And if you want to do that, if you want to change your, uh, the, the way your project looks, or the way your, your pages are laid out, um, if you go to insert, I think it is, or design, I'm looking for the word break, layout, layout. So under layout, this breaks, and you can have um, a next page. And what that'll do, that'll give you a new page, and you can then alter the layout of it. So if you insert the next page break, you can you can then change the layout. So I'll show you that actually in there. So you can see there I've got section break next page which enables me to switch across to that. And then I've got a, another section break somewhere there which enables me to switch back. So drawn the uh, drawn the layout, this is what I'm going to try and achieve. There's some description in there for the reader as well. And then underneath there's, um, there's an example of what everything does. So there's a discussion of what everything does and why it's in there. Now you don't have to make it work at this stage because 
in this case, what you've done is you said, I am going to build the forms, but you can say why the buttons are there. So why is this discount button there? Why is the update quantity button there? What will all these things do? Because you don't just want to draw a picture and say, that's what I'll do, because that's meaningless. You want to describe why, why it does it. And then finally, and this part is uh, the, the test plan. You'll need a test plan for every single um, part that you're, you're, you're planning out. Remember, you're planning it at the minute. You're not building it. But this test plan, I just want to draw your attention to because it comes up in the exams as well. Um, this is a very simple test plan. It works. Um, there's, there's no uh, difficulty um, in understanding it, hopefully. Um, but you've got a test number here. This is just a sequential number. Test number one, then we've got a test description. I'm going to um, load the login form from the executable. When you build a um, Visual Studio project, um, uh, you get a folder and in there called bin, and in there you've got your binary files, and under debug, you've got an executable. And you can just double click that and you, your project will work independently of Visual Studio. So we're going to try loading this directly from the executable and make sure that the login form appears first. That makes sense, doesn't it? Because you want things to be in the right order. Um, the expected result, because we haven't done it yet, we haven't got an actual result, that will come later. The expected result is the form loads and looks as I expected it to. Um, I will run this test on two different screen sizes, one at home and one at college, to ensure the forms look good on both. And that's a reasonable test as well. So we're not doing anything technical here, not doing anything particularly complicated. And the test type there is normal. And in test two, I won't read, read out all of these. Um, test two, test three, test four, they're all the same sort of thing. Um, I'm going to loan up various different forms. Um, the test type can be one of three things. Um, I've given some explanation in there. But there's normal, which is a normal thing that you do. So if you're playing a game on Unity, a normal thing to do would be to press the arrow keys. A normal thing to do would be to press WASD. A normal thing to do might be to press the space bar to do a jump. They're normal tests. Um, so you can write normal if it's a normal thing that you expect the user to do. If it's a weird thing and you don't expect the user to do, and you're trying to basically make the system crash, and this is uh, you're checking for robustness, um, then it's called an erroneous test, and I'll put the spelling in there. Um, so, an erroneous test is something weird. So, if you're going to, um, I don't know, hammer on the number pad over and over again to make sure that the program doesn't sort of blow up and cause any nasty errors, then you can put that in as an erroneous test. Um, uh, if you're going to right click numerous times, it's an erroneous test. If uh, you're asked for a value between 1 and 100 and you enter 154 or 2000, that's an erroneous test. So anything weird is an erroneous test. And you should test for erroneous inputs. Um, and the other one which people get confused on, and I will sort of, uh, not dwell on this too much longer, it's extreme. And extreme doesn't mean taking a computer and throwing it out the window, because that's an extreme thing to do. What extreme means is testing the boundaries. So if you're asked to enter a number between 1 and 100, um, let's say you're doing a survey, how pleased were you in, in, in percentage terms with the, the responses you got from the system? Um, 1 to 100. And the user enters 100. That's an extreme test. It's an extreme test because it's right on the upper edges of what you're allowed to put in. And can anyone think of what the other extreme test might be? If 100 is an extreme because it's right on the upper edge. Zero or one. Zero would be um, because that's on the, on the bottom edge. Yeah. Actually, is, is that below the bottom edge? Let's, let's make a rule up now. I don't know, that's why I said 1% as well. Yeah. Because it could start from 1 to 100%. And at so the same time so let's zero assume our system starts from, zero, it starts from 1. The lowest number you're allowed to put in is 1. Zero is an extreme test. Because it's just outside the boundary. And it'd be 101 as well, isn't it? Extreme? And 101. That's it. So, if you've got any questions about extreme testing, Connor's the man. Um, that's perfect. That's exactly what it is. But don't get confused and think extreme means doing something really wild. 
Um, anything wild is erroneous. Uh, so this is uh, sort of a, an example of how uh, a design phase might look. Um, hopefully, it's fairly easy to understand. You basically need to outline what you want to achieve. You can draw some images if, the, if it's relevant. Um, but one of the things you should be doing, particularly if it's just code, is something like this diagram here, or pseudocode, or a class diagram. Now, I think you know what pseudocode is. So I'm not, I'm not going to dwell on that too much. Um, Flowcharts. Has anyone not covered flowcharts in school or, or anywhere else? Do you know what flowcharts are? How they work? Does anyone not know what they are? Okay, there's, there's absolute silence, so I'm assuming you all know what they are. Yeah. Good. Right, okay, so flowcharts are a good thing because it shows how the program will work, how it deal with all the inputs. And if you struggle with those, please do let me know. Make sure you use the right um, symbols. This is one that I've copied out for students' work, and you'll notice here there's no star. So uh, the start and the end should use a terminator. And on Word, you can insert shapes, and in the flowchart shapes, and it pops up with actually what they do there. So if you struggle with those, you, you, can, you can use that. There's loads of YouTube videos as well. Um, so flowcharts, pseudocode, and class diagrams should all be in there at some point and also a test plan for each phase and like I said you can have as few as four phases if you want iterations let's call them right by the right thing um, and they all need to be in there so that the idea is you finish your design section you've got your let's say five iterations done you can take that and you can give that to anyone else who understands computing and they'll be able to build your project for you because it'll be clear enough for somebody else to understand. So I've put that in there, I'll email that out to you um, soon. Um, but I want to go through reasonably quickly what class diagrams look like. Do you need a breaker in your okay pushing on? Okay, utter silence again. So I'm gonna take that as an opportunity to just push on. Okay, so let's uh, let's, let's load this up. See if I can find my um yeah. my thing. And I'm not sure whether like writing on the board is gonna is gonna be useful here, because it can be a bit messy, but we'll see how it goes anyway. So you have decided for whatever reason in your project that you're going to um, model vehicles. Now you're not necessarily doing anything with them, you're, you're modelling them, they're, they're, they're driving across your screen, they're doing something. You could say it's in a game, it doesn't really matter. You could also use this um, as a, a way to model things in a shop, so items in Tesco's for example. And a class diagram is essentially a way of classifying the things in your programme. So you're going to classify the things in your programme. So in, in this case, I'm going to classify vehicles. Um, so we might model a car, we might model a lorry, we might model a bicycle, we might model a tank. And they all do different things. So uh, a lorry would have a, a sort of maximum load. It would have a, a number of axles and things like that that we might be interested in. Um, a bicycle might have... Um, particular types of handlebars, or it might have uh, particular types of wheels that we're interested in. And a tank, um, let's go for the obvious, might have a big gun that we want to be aware of, and we might want to model in our, in, in our program. So we're, we're gonna, I'm, I'm going to show you how we might model something like this, and hopefully you'll be able to take that and you'll be able to uh, apply it to other things. Hopefully. So. Um, what we want to do is we want to think about all these things. What do they have in common? And what word can we use to describe all of them? So a word we could probably use to describe all of those things would be uh, a vehicle. Yeah? That's going to be our, our super class. That's going to be our parent class for everything. Um, and within that, we want to... Um, all our vehicles, all of them, without fail, can turn left and they can turn right. And all of them uh, have got a, a speed, 
because they'll all be moving in our in our application, and all of them will have a color. Make sense? Yeah, so every single vehicle has got those things. Now you can probably think of a few more. They've, they've probably all got, actually no, the tank hasn't got wheels, has it? But um, they've, they've probably all got other things in common. Um, but this is an example. So the way we can lay out our classes is like this. We can draw a table and uh, we can write the name of the class at the top. In this case, this is vehicle. And um, then we can write in the attributes. So all the things you want to record about that vehicle. Now this is just, this is to cover all vehicles. This isn't to cover our bicycle, this isn't to cover our tank. This is all vehicles. So all vehicles have got a speed and all vehicles have got a colour. Um, and I'm going to store those as integers. Integer speed and integer colour. And all vehicles can turn left and they can turn right. Now, what turn left is, it's got these open and closing brackets at the end. That means it's a method. And um, what a method is, it's a, a function. So it's a bit of code, it's a, it's, a, it's a function. And when we call up turn left, we want our vehicle to turn left. And when we call up turn right, we want our vehicle to turn right. At this stage, we don't care how it works, but we just want to be able to tell the vehicle to turn left or turn right. So it's, it's functionality, it's, it's some sort of a, um, it's a, it, it, it's a, a method we call it, um, but it's, it's a call to some sort of function. Um, and we also want to be able to set the speed and the colour. So that's our vehicle class, that's our super class that enables us to uh, model a, uh, a vehicle. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to try using the board, sometimes it works, and generally it doesn't. I'm going to try using the board to sort of demonstrate how other things might work. I think this might be a bit better than just talking about it with a PowerPoint. I'm hoping that me moving about might, might be um, better. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the, the bicycle. The bicycle doesn't do much more than turn left or turn right. But the bicycle has a bell. And I want to be able to ring that bell. Let's uh, assume this is some sort of um, uh, one of those driving test simulators. Um, so what I could do is I can create a bicycle class. No, I can't because my pen's not working. Okay, I can create a bicycle class. Um, and I'm not going to give it any other attributes. It's got a speed and it's got a colour. I don't really care about what else it can do. So I'm going to leave that top section blank. But what I am going to do is I'm going to give it ring bell. Lowercase first letter, capital second letter, uh, for the second word, sorry. Open close round brackets. A ring bell um, is not going to return anything. Ring bell, if I, if I say bicycle ring bell, I want it to go ding and that's it. So I don't want it to send me anything back. So this is optional. I don't have to do this, but it's just for, for clarity. Um, I'm going to return void. It's going to be a, rather than a function, it's going to be a procedure. So you can differentiate between your functions and your procedure by writing the word void. And then what we do, we link that using an arrow with a direction on it to there. And what that means is that if ever you create a new bicycle, it will have uh, the ability to turn left and turn right. It will also have the ability to ring the bell as well. And the way we might do this in code would be um, uh, bicycle. I keep wanting to spell bicycle with a, with a one. B e I C Y C E. Bicycle, just. Um, my bike equals new. Now what I can say is my bike color equals red. This is pseudo code, not actual code. Um, I can say my bike 
Dot turn left. And that will turn my bike to the left. I can also say my bike and make it go ding. So I now have, because I've used something called inheritance, I've now inherited all of that stuff into my bicycle, which means I've got all of that functionality and the additional functionality that comes with the bicycle, so I can ring a bell. So, if I, before I ask you if it makes any sense, because generally these things only make sense once you see a few examples, I'll go on and I'll, um, I'll add another thing. So, this is, uh, this is the parent class. This is the, the parent class of all the, all the, the things within my, uh, with my diagram. Um, this is a subclass, but this is the actual bit that we use. Um, the other thing I might be interested in is creating a motor vehicle class. So, motor vehicle. Um, and a motor vehicle might have an integer, which is the size of the engine. Um, it might have a string, uh, which could be the number plate. And we might have um, some getters in this. Now obviously you could do a lot more than this. This isn't um, the, the be all and end all, but I'm just giving you some examples. Get engine size. And you might want to get num plate. And these are a particular type of method called a getter. Um, the other type of method you can use is a setter. So you can fill these up with, um, here we could have a set speed. get speed and you could do the same for colour um, and you can fill up if you're, if you're struggling with methods and you think what method can I put in there you could fill it up with getters and setters because you need to get all these things you need to set in these things and because these are, these are protected um, generally they shouldn't be public you shouldn't be able to see them from anywhere they should be protected because then you can set some uh, boundaries. So for example, if, if I wanted to set my speed at being uh, a million miles an hour, that's a little bit unrealistic. So what we can do is we can use a method called set speed, and that will check that my speed is within a given boundary, and then I can set it. So these things shouldn't be public, and you should use getters and setters. And if you're struggling to think, well, what can I put into my class diagram to make it look bigger and better, you can use getters and setters, and they're ways of um, managing the, the values that go in there. So I'll just take that out for a second for clarity. So this is my motor vehicle class, it, it's got a speed and a colour, now a motor vehicle's also got a size of an engine and a number plate. Now obviously I couldn't put that in here because that would be my bicycle would have a size of an engine, which obviously we don't want. So, this is now my motor vehicle class. And then I can take that down a bit further and I can create a car class. And I promise you I won't spend much longer on this. So here's my car class. And what can my car do? Well, a car can have a number of seats I might be interested in, which would be an int. I'm running out of space here. Um, and I, I might have um, other things. Int radio brand. And some of the things it might do, well, because starting a car is different to starting an, uh, um, a, a motorbike, um, the start method probably wouldn't work here. 
It might do, it might not. not. It really depends on the, on the makeup of your program. Um, but one of the things we, we might want to do with a car, we might want to service it on a regular basis. Maybe that's part of your program. So, service, we go in here as a method. And then when you create car, my car equals new car, when you create your, your car, you've then got access to absolutely everything. So you can say my car dot service. My writing's terrible in here. So my car dot service comes from here. I can also say my car dot turn left. And all of this is inheritance. So that goes for there. So that when you when you inherit from here, you get all of this functionality and all of this functionality. So a class diagram is a way of classifying the things in your program. So I'll quickly, not with everyone, but I'll pick on a few people and we'll, we'll talk about how your class diagram might look. So, Hazy, uh, you, your program, what is it? Uh, it's a 2D platformer. 2D platformer. So, any ideas what a class diagram might look for that? Look like for that? Okay. Alright. What can I think about what it's about and then I can break it down? Um, I don't know. I could have one for. Oh no, we'll take the player. Yes, very good. Because the player's got yeah. lots of things that only the player does. Mm. So the player's a good example of a class. Okay. So that could be a class. Um, probably on its own player, um, a number of um, variables, number of attributes, and some things that the player can do, such as jump, such as collect coins, such as uh, uh, dying. Yeah? So all those things that the player can do. So that's a good example. And you might also have a collectible to be a class. And then you could apply that to a coin, you could apply it to a key, apply it to some treasure. Um, but basically that would be a script that you pull into that particular item on the screen and collectible would enable it to do certain things. So it would enable it to disappear and it hits the player um, and then you might have a method for that to disappear. Um, it would also uh, make, play, make play a sound, so play collected sound. Um, and it might do other things like add points. So you have another method called add points. Um, enemies. Got any enemies in your game? Yeah. Yeah? So again, same sort of thing. Similar class to the player, um, but I wouldn't necessarily, I, I don't see the point in creating some inheritance just for the sake of it, just because it's a thing that moves, um, because it moves autonomously. So uh, probably a new class altogether as well. And that can be separate, so it can be a separate area here. It doesn't need to link to anything. It just shows all these players, it just shows all the classes, all the classifications in your game. So your enemy class can have um, move left, move right, if it's just going back and forth across the platform. Um, it could have uh, interact, or it could have a launch missile, or it could have um, some sort of kill player uh, method. All those things can go in there. And um, you might have things where inheritance is possible. So, um, in, a, in a 2D platformer, you might uh, have, what might you have? You might have um, different characters that unlock different things to do. Good like point. That. Yes, yeah. thank you. Yes. Uh, yes, yeah, so you might have different characters. So, you might have a, 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 a main um, character class, maybe an NPC. Unlockables or, as well. Something like that. Yeah. And then off that, you could then have your, your characters doing their particular deeds, whatever they need to do. So they'll all behave in the same way, but they will be able to, they'll have different powers or different skills and they'll be able to work in a different way. Thank you for that. So your class diagram doesn't need to be a series of things all linked together, like that vehicle thing, but it, you want to try and classify and think about what these individual objects might do in your game. Class object means the same thing. Actually, I should probably clarify that. 
Uh, a, a class is the blueprint, a class is what we've just drawn on here. When I make it into my vehicle, then it becomes an object, because then I can set my vehicle to be blue and I can give it a speed of 100, whereas every vehicle doesn't have that. So the, the blueprint, the actual way we write it, is the class, and when we drag it into our game, it's the object. Um, should pick on one more? I know Josh is doing a platformer as well. You, what do you do? RPG. Um, sorry? RPG. RPG. So it's going to be similar. It's going to be similar in terms of uh, like. Alex, what, what, what are you doing? Are you doing a game as well? Um, I think so. I don't really know. Yeah? Um, um, your, your game's got a bit more to it though, hasn't it? Well. Chat, chat room, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, sort of yeah. local. I don't know. Yeah. Like real time strategy or something, if I can get to it. And okay. you can sort of play each other on the network. Do you think of any uh, classes that you might use to, to model the chat part of it? Um, well, if you've got uh, if you've got to like sort of monitor who's on the network, you could have a class for the name of the person, where they are, what they're on. Sort Good. So you could have a person class, yeah. and you could model our IP address, and you could model. Um, uh, the number of um, dodgy words that they've said, um, so you, you know where to ban them, and you can monitor other things about them within that class. Yeah? yeah? Good, all right, that's fantastic. Uh, and you're doing a game as well? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay, so I won't drone on about class diagrams anymore, but hopefully that's sufficient. What I will do though is I'll email out um, the, the picture, which is here, uh, the example. There. So that was the example I was working off, just basically shows shows that and it can go down to the motorbikes and cars, but I didn't want to drive on too long. Um, and I'll send you out the updated document, and then please talk to me if you've got any problems. I won't talk any more though because I feel like I've done too much of it, especially considering you've had a long break. Um, any questions now? Okay, I'll come around and see you. I'll come around and see you.